Welcome to Life Matters. I'm your host, Brendan O'Connell. Today's show examines the ominous threat that modern-day eugenics and euthanasia pose to someone with a disability or perceived disability. Why does mankind want to kill other members of society that supposedly have a disability or are unable to be productive members of society? Or prenatal babies tested to be less than perfect? Or perhaps the other end of the spectrum? You're just too old. Why and how is eugenics, assisted suicide, and euthanasia movement trying to conquer Massachusetts next with the referendum in November of 2012 election called Death with Dignity? Isn't doctor-prescribed suicide a more accurate description? And lastly, will the slippery slope next include killing for organs or denying disabled children transplants? Today's guest is the co-director of the Institute for the Study of Disability and Bioethics. He's a recognized expert in both nationally and internationally on disability issues. He appears regularly on radio and television and writes about a disability and bioethical issues in the print media. He consults on disability issues at the United Nations. He's served as a member of the International Euthanasia Prevention Council He's also a professor of special education at Regent University in Virginia. Today's show delves further into the broad mosaic of the Right to Life movement. I confidently believe you'll find today's show to be unique, informative, content-rich, truthful, and thought-provoking. Well, welcome, Dr. Mark Moster. Uh, good afternoon. Nice to be with you. Uh, Mark, um, I, I know in Germany we had uh, a propaganda campaign that called the uh, uh, life unworthy of life and uh, useless eaters. Uh, in Massachusetts, uh, what's the propaganda, and is it similar to other states around our nation? Yeah, it's exactly the same as what's been happening in other places in the U.S. And, and let me just provide a little bit of context here. Uh, when we talked a while ago, we talked about what happened in, in Nazi Germany, and this whole idea of propaganda is central to uh, the, the, the pro-death crowd, the, uh, the culture of death, bending public will and bending public opinion and therefore bending political opinion and eventually legal opinion to what they want. And the ultimate goal of all the pro-deaf people, for better or for worse, is this. They eventually want, this is their holy grail, their holy grail is death on demand, anytime, anywhere, and for any reason, for anyone. That's the ultimate goal. Now, they're not there yet, but they certainly are well on their way. And it's come, unfortunately, uh, to your state, to Massachusetts, where uh, it looks like they have somewhat of a foothold, but the game's not over yet. The, the, the battle is not over yet. Uh, essentially, what the pro-deathers have thought is after their uh, wins in Washington state and in Oregon, that they needed to find a, a place in the country that was more hospitable in some ways to their efforts than others. And so what they did was they looked at all the states that did not have assisted suicide law on the books and said, where can we go to establish a foothold next? And they've decided that that's New England. And uh, we've seen activity, as I mentioned, in New Hampshire and in Vermont, uh, efforts that have so far been turned down. But the one in Massachusetts is probably the most dangerous one of all. And what they've done in, in Massachusetts is come in, formed a grassroots organization, uh, they're very well funded, as they have been in other states, and they are now poised to add to your uh, electoral ballot for November um, the very thing that we all fear and that we don't want, and that is should uh, assisted suicide be legalized. And they bring along whole bunches of polls and quote-unquote research that you know everybody wants this and everybody thinks this is a great idea and who wants to suffer before they die on and on and on, all half-truths uh, that we can get into in a little bit if you want to. But basically, the push is to change the language, to change the debate, and then also to make sure that people are not educated about the other side. And they've done a fairly good job of that in Massachusetts, of saying, we have all the truth, we have all the research, and then they play on people's fears. Nobody wants to think of themselves as dying alone. Nobody wants to think of themselves as dying in excruciating pain. Nobody really wants to be a burden to anybody else in their last days. And they play on these fears in order to get people 
uh, to support their agenda. And it remains to be seen what the opposition can do in Massachusetts. There are several groups that are, are, are very heavily involved. But we have to get the word out. This is not a good idea for anybody in Massachusetts under any circumstances. Well, uh, well how, how does one do that? In other words, the, I know when we deal with the abortion issue, they've got a three or four euphemisms they use. Is, right. is the euthanasia eugenics thing same thing? They've got three or four euthanisms, but don't look too much below the surface to what really oh, oh, goes yeah, on? Oh, yeah, no, no question about that. Uh, they, the, the, the prime example is the, the movers and shakers who are behind this, uh, which uh, are, are the organization Compassion and Choices. Now, now that, was the, that was called the Hemlock Society before. Well, I, I was about to say, the, you, if you track down the history of, of, of all of these uh, quote-unquote organizations that are involved, what you find is, is that there are the same people uh, who've been involved for the same 30 year, 40 years, and what they do is they recycle themselves and reinvent themselves in one organization after another. Now, the Hemlock Society was, was, of course, founded by Derek Humphrey. He wrote the book Final Exit. And Humphrey uh, decided a long time ago that uh, the word hemlock in Hemlock Society was not very positive. It was not very soothing. Uh, it actually said what it meant, and that was uh, a society that celebrated death by poisoning. So eventually, over the years, it morphed into several other organizations. There were organizations that split off in the interim. But what we've been left with is a, a morphing from Hemlock Society into the much more palatable, much more comfortable, touchy-feely Compassion and Choices. And Compassion and Choices are still the same old pro-death people, the culture of deaf people who want that ultimate holy grail goal to be instituted everywhere. And that's what they're about in Massachusetts. They're, they're heavily funded. They're very well organized. Uh, they, they do things that are strategically actually very important. And the, one of the big things they do in this strategy is change the language. I'm sure we've all heard the old, the old adage that he who controls the language controls the debate. And that's exactly what they do. So they, they talk about this. You can actually find this on their website. It's, it's not a secret. Uh, where they talk about, we really don't want to talk about assisted suicide. Okay, assisted suicide sounds like somebody gets killed, and it sounds like it might be messy and awkward. So ch change that around. And if a doctor does it, you don't want to say uh, physician-assisted suicide. That you know th that that's a little bit much. Um, Even you know, though it's it, accurate, correct? It really is. Well, it's absolutely accurate. Yes, what you are doing is assisting somebody to kill themselves. It's that simple. The, the there's no there's no two ways about that. What you are doing, certainly, if doctors prescribe the fatal dose is you're, as a doctor, are prescribing a fatal, fatal, uh, uh, fatal dose that is then uh, presented to the person. The person then ingests the fatal dose and dies. That is what assisted suicide is. And so they come up with other terms. Instead of physician-assisted suicide or assisted suicide, talk about uh, aid in dying, which is the big one that's come up in Massachusetts, or death with dignity, or medically assisted uh, dying. Uh, physician managed death is one of my favorites. <laughs> uh, don't call it suicide, anything but. They have many others. For example, self-deliverance, um, you know, uh, patient-directed dying. And all of these euphemisms for this very horrible and very selfish act uh, are, are, are said and repeated over and over again to where people start to think, hey, you know, assisted suicide, we, we don't want to talk about that, but this, uh, you know, this uh, managed uh, end of our lives or, 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 you know, whatever, turns it into something that's almost uh, a positive, almost a um, something that, that, that one should aspire to. And they do a very good job of that. And the moment that happens, people get away. The general public is not educated that, yes, this is actually uh, uh, a number of euphemism, euphemisms that are used in order to soften the blow and to make this more palatable. Hmm. And what is it that, that we can do to um, let people know that, uh, that these are euphemisms, they're, they're feel-good words? I guess, how do we educate so that people understand that, uh, that it's, you know, it's, it's really murder, is what it is. Yeah, well, yes, indeed. Uh, well, the, the first thing is be aware of what they call it and then call it what it really is. So if you run into someone, perhaps one of those people 
we're trying to get you to sign a petition, and they're going on about, um, you know, people who have passed away or people who have gone to another world. Uh, I, it, it's good to call them on it. You mean people who, who have died? Is that what you're saying? Well, yes, but, you know, we like to call it so-and-so. The same about, about uh, assisted suicide. You know, when they start to bring up these euphemisms, correct them and say, well, you're talking about uh, a doctor providing poison to kill someone, right? Uh, that, that level alone, if people would just understand at that level with the language that so much can be done and be aware in all these uh, petitions and ads and whatever else, uh, letters to the editor that they run, look for these words and you will certainly be able to tell who are on the pro-death side and who are on the pro-life side. Yeah. There's many other things uh, people can do, but I think that's the first one. Get, get acquainted with the issues. Get acquainted with the language, and there are many places uh, that that can be done. Something else I would recommend is that uh, people might get together in, in little study groups and study these issues because they are important. If you're in Massachusetts, uh, look at what this proposed ballot initiative is all about. Look at what it's proposing. Uh, how do they go about saying this should happen, and, and, and learn what they say and then oppose what they say. All of those things are fairly easy to do and don't take too much time, but they have to be done in order to counter the language, counter the argument, and then get out there and share it with everybody you can, your, your friends, your neighbors, everyone who raises this issue, and I'm sure it's very visible in Massachusetts right now. You know, say to people who have no idea, you know, do you understand what this means? Do you understand that, that this is anything but compassion? This is about killing people uh, who obviously are not dead yet, uh, who obviously may not be dead in the next couple of weeks. It's killing people simply because they fear something. It's playing on people's fears. It's not playing on anything positive about comfort or about love or responsibility. It's simply saying, if you're frightened of this way to die, then we have a way out for you. Counter that at, at, at absolutely every every chance you get. And I would also say, that um, uh, I, I noticed that the Roman Catholic Church has been very, very much in the forefront of this battle, and I so do appreciate that, in, in, in saying this cannot stand, this is contrary to, to church teaching, and uh, if, if, if you subscribe to our faith, this is something that you cannot do. So I would encourage everybody uh, in, the, uh, in the churches, uh, your pastors, your, your, your priests, or your lay people, to really come around and have a look at all these issues carefully. And don't only look at what's happening in Massachusetts. If you simply do something as simple as Google uh, assisted suicide, you will come up across, across 100 million things that can be very educative. There are also places on the web where you can get a lot of information, and I'll just mention three of them. The one is a website called euthanasia.com. Very simple, euthanasia.com, and they have a lot of articles on all these issues uh, certainly from uh, from our perspective. The other uh, organization or the other website would be uh, the Patient Rights Council, which is run by Rita Marker, who's an attorney out in Ohio, has very much, up to, very much uh, come to be a, a site to find things, a lot of resources. And then thirdly, I would mention uh, my web blog, uh, my news blog, which basically calls information on all these issues from all over the world and puts them up on my site that you can go directly to them. There's a link to the pieces and read about what's happening not only here but in the world. And that's called Dr. Mark Alive and Kicking. Dr. Mark Alive and Kicking. If you Google it, you'll come up to the website and there'll be a lot of information there. Well, in fact, on the screen we have Dr. Mark Alive and Kicking dot blogspot dot com. That's correct. Now, one of the things that uh, I was told, and I find it very interesting, is one of the reasons they had chosen Massachusetts is because it's an expensive media market, and the pro-death crowd, I guess, has more money than the sure. pro pro-life crowd. So that would give them a competitive advantage, particularly in the last week or two before the vote in November. Is that well? Th is that they typical? Do, they, yeah. Oh, absolutely. That's typical. I, I can give you other examples for, uh, in, in how this strategy works. This is very well thought out. Um, in in um, in Washington. What they did was way before they even talked about getting anything on the ballot, let alone a law, they went in and identified their, uh, their legal counsel who would be on their side and, and obviously retained those people. However, they also retained a whole bunch of other attorneys who they thought would be their opposition. So once they had retained those attorneys, obviously those attorneys could not then take on the pro-life side of the issue in Washington State. 
So that's how deep the strategy runs. It's not a matter simply of the language and signing ballot in, uh, signatures for a ballot initiative. They actually have an entire strategy that says, let's go in there and take the opposition out even before the opposition knows they should be the opposition. And, and, and again, I think on our side, we need to be more organized. We need to be uh, more vocal in what we want to say and what we want to do and be as, as strategic as they are. Um, you know, again, fundraising is a major issue, always has been. Um, that's something that's ongoing. But I think in, in the end, although we maybe are a little uh, outgunned in the fundraising department, I think we have, uh, you know, true morality and, and, and true compassion on our side, and that, that counts for a lot in these kinds of debates. I see. You know, one very uh, positive thing happened recently, and uh, that is, is that the Massachusetts Medical Society right. voted to not endorse this bill. Yeah. What did you think of that? Was, was that a strategy? Was, was the other side trying to get them to endorse it? Well, that's, that's how the vote happened. Uh, essentially what happened was th this wouldn't have been up for a vote uh, anytime soon, except that there were elements within the society who started raising the issue that perhaps the society should not uh, <clears throat> come, out, uh, in f uh, come out against uh, assisted suicide. And because there are people already within the society, not many, but enough, in the society basically already advocating for uh, changing the society's stance uh, from opposing assisted suicide to at least being neutral and preferably to being for it. Uh, that's what happened. That precipitated, those people made enough noise within the society that it precipitated a discussion and then a vote uh, uh, across the society to see whether this should be changed from a, an opposition to a, uh, a, a neutral stance or even to endorsing it. And luckily, uh, the vote was overwhelming that the uh, Massachusetts, Massachusetts Medical Society voted overwhelming, overwhelmingly in favor of opposing assisted suicide. However, there was a minority that voted to change it, and I will guarantee you that that minority will become more and more vocal. They will also be given more and more money by outfits like Compassion and Choices, and they will, over the next couple of years, repeatedly in the society's meetings and conferences, repeatedly bring up the issue. And let me tell you something about these people. These people are tenacious. These people do not fold up and run away the first time they are defeated. They come back again and again and again and absolutely uh, will be back, uh, if not this year, next year, on all of these issues. And so that's what's going to happen, I predict, in, in the, the medical society, that these issues will be brought up again and again, and slowly they'll chip away at the opposition until they eventually... Uh, get what they want, which is, again, the holy grail, assisted suicide anytime, anywhere, for anybody. Wow. Well, I'd like to also now address a couple of uh, articles that I had read recently. Um, one had to do with the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. It was called yeah. The Ugly Face of the New, New, New Eugenics. Yeah. Could you tell our audience a little bit about this, what, the, what that's all about? Yeah, well, for, for many years I've, I've argued, and again this stems from, from some of my work in, in, in Nazi Germany before the Second World War, is that we tend to think, uh, or many people think, if they know anything about eugenics at all, uh, consider it to be something that happened then and, and couldn't possibly be happening now. I mean, you know, the Nazis actually rounded up people who were disabled or different and said, you know, you're worth less than people who don't have your disability, so we're going to kill you. And, and when you, or we're going to sterilize you so that you can't procreate what we think are imperfect human beings. We tend to think of that as long past. But the truth is, it's back with a vengeance. The whole idea that your genetic makeup now determines certain medical procedures, which sometimes are not very helpful to you. Two examples. One, the old example that I think most of your listeners will know, and that is that uh, now that we can identify children with Down syndrome in utero, that many, if not most, of those unborn children are aborted simply because they have a different genetic makeup and simply because there is massive pressure put on the parents to abort with arguments like your child will have a poor quality of life, your child will have health problems. Do you really want to have this child that will take up so much of your time, or how about aborting and maybe having another kid that doesn't have this problem? We, we know that that goes on, and we know that's why we don't see too many people with Down syndrome around anymore, is because they're all being aborted. 
what's happened what, what what's happened lately is that now we're starting to see with genetic testing and also in medical circles where doctors are now trained much more in this utilitarian style of, of medicine, you know, getting the most bang for the buck, that they are starting to discriminate not only against unborn children, but against children when they are born. And the latest example comes out of Philadelphia, as you mentioned, where a couple had a child with, um, with wolf hirschhorn syndrome. Now, that's a genetic an- an- anomaly that basically means the child will have uh, quite severe health problems, heart problems, circulatory problems. Uh, almost always these children are mentally challenged, um, and, and their, their prognosis for an incredibly long life is not good. And these parents had a, a, a two-, three-year-old called Amelia, and they'd been to uh, the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia ever since she'd been born, and obviously this kid had problems, and eventually what came up was that she would need a kidney transplant. And what happened was they went in and spoke to a doctor who said, uh, I'm shortening the story, but who said basically and very clearly and very bluntly that we are not at liberty to provide your child with a kidney because your child has brain damage and mental retardation. And the parents were stunned. And they said, well, wait a minute, we, we don't need to be on any donor list. We're, we're gonna, someone in our family can donate. And they said, oh, no, it doesn't matter. Who, if, even if you can organize the donation, it's not going to happen. We are saying that because your child has a poor quality of life, will continue to have a poor quality of life, and is, uh, is brain damaged and mentally retarded, that we simply are not going to uh, provide uh, a kidney transplant. Now, that says uh, another thing to me. It also says we have other children who we will give kidney transplants to because they are not retarded or brain damaged. And so in not too subtle ways, we have the medical establishment, certainly in this case, making, uh, making the argument that basically if you have a serious medical disability or a, 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 uh, an intellectual disability, you are a second-class citizen in, in this country and certainly at the hospital. We see you differently because of your genetic makeup from others. And based on that difference in genetic makeup, we will discriminate against you by not allowing a kidney transplant for your child, but we will allow it for others. That, to me, is, is eugenics. Uh, absolutely and clearly. The idea that you, you want to give your medical treatment to kids that can get better, you want to give your medical treatment to those who will be able to have a quote-unquote good quality of life, and you want to give all your medical care and all the medical dollars to people who at some point will be able to contribute to your society. That's exactly what the Nazis did. Now, the difference, of course, between the Nazis in this case is that the Nazis uh, made no bones about killing, killing people with disabilities. Uh, however, if you don't give this girl a kidney, she's going to die in the next couple of years as well. And the point I made was, is k- killing a child by not giving her a kidney because she is disabled that much different than what the Nazis did? I submit that it's not. Mm-hmm. And, you know, we've only got a minute left, but I was wondering if you could tell me about the American Thinker article. And this had, it, was, it was entitled, Killing for Organs. Yeah, uh, very briefly, uh, what we have is a supply and demand problem. There are more people that need organs uh, versus people that, that can donate them. And so people are trying to figure out ways, creative ways, of getting more organs for transplantation, which in and of itself is not necessarily a bad idea. But two things are happening. One, we are now starting to see in Europe that uh, people who request to be euthanized uh, are, are, are asked if they would like to donate their organs after death. And now there's a whole medical protocol about when exactly you euthanize these people in hospitals so you can rush their organs next door for, 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 the, uh, for the recipient. Uh, that has raised issues in medical circles that are now being debated. The debate is, when are you truly dead? It used to be that your heart had to stop and your brain activity had to stop. But by the time the brain activity stops, the organs have started to deteriorate. And what we're seeing more and more is that cardiac death alone, even though there is still brain activity, once you, your heart stops, but before your, your brain activity stops, that organs are going to be harvested from your body. Wow, that's really Excuse something. Me. That's incredible. <laughs> and also, in, in many countries, this is now a black market issue, where, um, in, for example, in China, uh, uh, convicts are executed, and there's a, there's a, a medical van waiting at the execution site to harvest their organs. 
Uh, we're starting to see mobile organ harvesting units now come up in, in Italy where uh, people are killed and their organs harvested somewhere out in the desert. They're put in, in, in packed ice in this van and taken off to be sold to the highest bidder. Wow. So more and more we're becoming uh, less than the sum of our parts. Uh, and huh. if you have an organ that we think might work, it looks very attractive. Let's change all the rules just to get at it. Wow, that's something. That's incredible, uh, Dr. Mostert. Uh, well, um, I'm sorry our time is so short, but in closing, we hope you learned a lot today about another aspect of the Right to Life movement, and I'd be remiss if I didn't mention our website, lifematterstv.org. Finally, we hope you'll inform others of our show, Life Matters. We're confident that if people know the truth, they'll ultimately change their hearts and minds to pure love and kindness for the preborn, the sick and the infirm, the disabled, the elderly, and all humanity. Thanks for watching. I'm Brendan O'Connell, your friend for life.